Uh, Michael, my name is Con Hogan. Um, I live here in Clanmel, originally from near to Prairie Town, um, and um, formerly worked with Mark Trapper Dome and retired now for a number of years. Very involved in the GAA, I was chairman of the Tipperary County Board in my time and still involved with Semple Stadium and um, still active generally in, in the community. And where were you born and reared? I was born and reared in a place called Roseborough, between Tipperary and Latin. Um, the house that where I was born and where we lived was um, originally a Dalton home. Um, my grandfather, Tom Hogan, married into Mary Dalton. And uh, sadly, both of them died in 1918 of the Great Flu um, within a week of each other and left their children as, as orphans. Um, so, the, I suppose Hogan and, and um, uh, Dalton families were very connected through, really through nationalism. The Daltons were a very old national family in um, Tipperary Town and the Hogans were from farming people from out of the land outside Tip and um, very involved in nationalist activities going right back to kind of support for Parnell and the repeal movement and all that. So I suppose they were kind of uh, kindred spirits and I suppose that's how they, they came together. And is that family home still there? No, well, it, it's it's still there, but it was so. My my family, my father, uh, eventually inherited the place, and um, we sold that farm. It was a small farm, and we sold that farm in 1964 and moved to Capo White. And I'd be more identified with Capo White now than 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 um, near to Prairie. Although I only lived a short time there, I moved to Dublin in 1966 and joined the Air Corps as an apprentice and, as, as they say, the rest is history. And what's the connection with the Maloneys? My uh, great-grandfather, my, well, my mother was Maloney, and her grandfather was PJ Maloney. Now, the Maloneys were from Gotrum, they are from the parish of Salahed, going back to the kind of 1600s. And, um, uh, uh, my immediate great-grandfather, P.J. Maloney, was born in Gotram in 1869. And um, one of a family of 13. Uh, families were, were big that time. And uh, he went to school in Prairie Town and um, uh, went on then to train as a pharmacist in Limerick, um, where he met his wife. His wife was a widow. She had four children. She was a Mrs. Hannan. She was originally O'Brien from Nina. And uh, Ellen Hannan married P.J. Maloney and had four children. Four children were May, uh, Jim, Con, who was my grandfather and I'm called after him, and Pat. And uh, they were all born in Limerick. And around 1910, P.J. came back to Tipperary Town and set up a pharmacy business in, um, uh, in, in Tipperary, on the corner of Church Street and Main Street, where the Maid of Erden statue is now. And in fact, there's a, there's a plaque there to the, to the Maloney family. Um, so PJ was, again, a very, very active supporter of Parnell and of Home Rule, and, um, but completely changed his way of thinking uh, in 1914 when uh, the Parliamentary Party and, and Redmond um, uh, opted to support Britain in the Great War and uh, supported the suspension of Home Rule. Uh, PJ was vehemently opposed to that and very much threw his lot in with Sinn Féin at that time and became one of the organisers of Sinn Féin into Prairie along with um, Louis Dalton, who, had, who was again a, a relation of mine on the, on the Hogan side, and, and Louis and, they, and he became uh, connected through marriage later on, and I'll talk about that in a little while. So PJ became very involved 
in Sinn Féin and um, was arrested after the 1916 rising. Uh, a lot of the Sinn Féin people around the country were rounded up after the 1916 rising, PJ among them, and spent time in, um, in Scotland, in, 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 interned in Scotland, and, and um, was released later that year. Um, and he wrote a jail journal, um, uh, which only came to light in the last couple of years, really very interesting because it's a contemporaneous account of how he thought at that time. It was discovered in the, in the British Army, or the British um, archives in Kew, um, only a few years ago. And um, I'm his great-grandson, and he's, he's another great-grandson uh, who's a noted historian, Trinity historian, um, uh, um, and uh, just he kind of uh, uh, publicised it, and 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 if you like, somebody in his department discovered it. Um, so, uh, Yunan O'Halpin is the name of that that historian. So Yunan and I would be second cousins. We'd be the same relation of P.J. Maloney. So um, then when. The, um, after 1916, when he came back to Tip, PJ became very involved in the organisation of Sinn Féin, which had been established in the Rotunda in Dublin, I think, in 1913. And um, uh, Louis Dalton became president of Sinn Féin in Tipperary Town, and, and um, uh, PJ was secretary. And indeed, my own grandfather, Tom Hogan, who subsequently, as I said, died in 1918, um, uh, was the vice chairman. So they were all very involved, and I suppose my family involvement couldn't have been deeper um, uh, from, from, from all sides. So, um, uh, so he's, he operated his business in Church Street as a pharmacist, and um, as I say, was very active in, in the formation of Sinn Féin. What, what year was that, Con? Well, from after 1916, right along. And they became involved, very much involved then, you see, with the, as we know, you had the, 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 the whole, the part of the fallout from the Great War and the split, was the split in the volunteers. Um, and you had the, um, the national volunteers split and he went with the, with the, the, the smaller group. Uh, the, the major part of the volunteers supported Redmond and went on to fight in the Great War, many of them. Um, but the, the group that became known as the Irish Volunteers uh, were very much uh, um, supporting um, uh, independence and, and were prepared to fight for that. And uh, he was involved in the setting up of the, um, uh, the Volunteers, the Irish Volunteers, very actively into Prairie Town, as were his sons. How old was he at this stage? Well, there you are. He was he was older than most of them. Like he, he was born in eighteen sixty nine, so um, he would have been what? He would have been 46, in his late thirties, isn't that right? In nineteen sixteen, so thirty. He would he would have been more. He would have been forty seven or eight. So he was he was an elder. Person way older, obviously, than now the, 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 the people who, who were involved in the formation of the volunteers, like Sean Tracy, Dan Breen, um, were the Morris Crow. They were the prime movers into Prairie Town, the Maloney brothers, uh, the Barlows, um, the Fitzpatricks. Uh, they were, but they were all young. They were really kids, really, when you think of it. Um, like in 1916, my grandfather mobilised, actually, the Galti Battalion mobilised. I think that's not generally known. The, a group mobilised here in Plan Mail, and they're commemorated. But the, a group mobilised uh, in, in Tipperary as well. They were known as the Galti Battalion at that time. And Con, he was only 19, but obviously he, he, he was one of the, the leaders at the time. So, uh, Sean Tracy was very young as well. You know, when you think of it, they really were very young men. Yes, he was an extraordinary man, an extraordinary organiser and that. So anyway, the, after 1916, the work of setting up the, the volunteers, if you like, moved on a pace and, and um, 
by 1918, there were six battalions in Tipperary. And uh, the, that led to the formation of the 3rd Tipperary Brigade. And that happened, I think, in around October, no, June, or sometime in 1918, in P.J. Maloney's house in Tipperary. And Dick Mulcahy, inter very interestingly, Dick Mulcahy came down from headquarters to preside over the formation of the Tulsa Prayer Brigade. And when you think of it, Dick Mulcahy was very much on the on the, the Free State side after. So the friendships were so sad the way they were sundered and all that at that time. Uh, but, um, uh, was PJ married at that time? Yeah, PJ married. Um, PJ's four children were born um, before he moved to Tipperary. In fact, they were all born. I think the youngest Paddy was born in 1899, and I think the eldest May was born in 1895. Or so there were four children who were born uh, in fairly close succession. And uh, but he was living in Limerick at that time. So he he married about 1895 or around that time to Ellen. Hannan, who had four children from a previous marriage, her husband had died. And the, the Hannan thing became very interesting after, which I'll kind of get to. So, so PJ had, he brought his four children to Tipperary and set up his pharmacy in Tipperary town. And as I said, became very active in the setting up of the volunteers and uh, along with Louis Dalton and, and others. And, uh, well, they were more active on the Sinn Féin side of it, whereas the, his sons, Con particularly, and Jim, were more active in the setting up of the volunteers, because of the young man's game, I suppose. But the, the, the third brigade was formed in his house. Uh, so then PJ, in, he was, he was um, obviously when, when the kind of war of independence started then in January 1919, really kicked off, if you like, in Salahid Beg. Um, uh, the lads were, had, were very, had, most of them had been in jail by then and, and all of that for organizing. And um, so his place became very much a, a, a kind of a hotbed. And um, just to give you an idea of, you know, the way his life went at that time, um, he was elected to the first doll in 19, the end of 1918. Um, and indeed I have a sticker which I show you, it, oh, not a sticker because they weren't sticky at the time, but he had a, this is a lapel badge that was worn by his supporters at that time uh, in, in 1918. It's quite a, I doubt if there's one of them anywhere else in the world now, but my aunt who's still alive, or his granddaughter at 93 discovered it in a book recently and gave it to me so it's 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 a it's very much a family heirloom but um so he was elected defeated a great nationalist actually a man by the name of john cullinan from bancher who had been involved in the land wars and had been in jail and all that but that was it the, the irish parliamentary party just ran out of steam at that time over their involvement with really over their position on the Great War and, and the whole mood thing. So he attended then the first meeting in the Dáil on the 21st of January 1919. And um, at the same time, on that day, Sally had begged to place. And his son, Con, was the adjutant of the brigade and was one of the organisers. So, um, but to kind of give you a feel for the things that happened to him, you know, um, his son Paddy was arrested in March of that year and jailed in May. Darlairn was declared illegal and went underground. Conn was jailed in November. He was elected the Sinn Féin chairman of the Prairie Urban Council in, in, in uh, 1920. He was arrested and spent um, in, in, in 1920. And, and um, uh, from March to May he was in Wormwood Scrubs and did hunger strike. PJ did, um, and uh, released then. And then his house was bombed on the 18th of, of, of uh, October 1920, so the day Sean Tracy was buried. And then November the 13th, his house was burned down. And his son Paddy was shot dead 
in Gortrom in May 1921. So it was, it was huge, I suppose, it was very deep involvement and it kind of gets you to thinking why he took the anti-treaty side. He had given so much, I suppose, to, um, uh, to break the link with the British Empire that, as he said in his Doyle speech rejecting the treaty, he said he didn't want, couldn't live between two hills, the two hills being occupation or the fallout of the treaty, which was still being part of the empire. So that was his thinking at the time. And you can, you know, when you see all the things that happened, you can understand it. Uh, so um, that was PJ. He, he stood then... Um, uh, he's, 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 he was a member of the second and third Dolls, and then he um, didn't stand for the fourth Doll, but in the meantime, Louis Dalton, who I mentioned, who was president of Sinn Féin and Tipperary, and one of a very old nationalist family. His father, actually, Louis Dalton's father, Michael Dalton, had an Irish language newspaper into Prairie in the 1860s. I think there were about seven editions of it. But he was a very staunch friend of William O'Brien and the whole Land League and uh, the whole repeal movement and that. And uh, so, so that's where he, and his son, his other son, uh, Michael O'B. Dalton, indeed you could, you could do a whole program on the Daltons. Uh, Michael O'B. was one of the leaders of the planning campaign into Prairie Town and the building of new to Prairie which is a whole history project in itself. Um, that was, uh, um, the, uh, he and Father Dave Humphreys were the local leaders of that, and uh, local leaders of the planning campaign. In fact, it is said that the, the, the cost of building New Prairie really broke the planning campaign financially, uh, nationally, which was, which was basically a campaign to, to withdraw, withhold um, uh, rents. The, the, the landlords. So um, uh, PJ then went back to his pharmacy business and lived until 1949. Uh, stayed very strongly um, and he, so he was a great friend of De Valera's and maintained his friendship with Dev and um, died when he died Dev was at his funeral. On the other hand Louis Dalton had married um, PJ's stepdaughter, Bordy Hannon. Do you remember Ellen had, had a family of Han four Hannons before, um, before um, she married PJ? And her daughter, PJ's stepdaughter, Bordy Hannon, married Louis Dalton. So um, you had the ardent anti treatyite, PJ, whose, whose stepdaughter was married to, to um, Louis Dalton. And Louis actually became a member of the fifth doll on the pro treaty side. So there you have the the, the history and the way the the way the views diverged at the time, sincerely held on all sides. Um, so that was that and, was P J. And P J. Was there any records of his activities during the Civil War? Well, uh, he, he, they were burned out. And uh, they moved actually to Dublin. They were burned out before the Civil War, during, during the War of Independence, um, kind of towards the end of the War of Independence. Um, and very interesting, they moved to Dublin, where they lived in a house given to them by Michael Collins. And uh, my grandfather, Con, his son, was married out of that house in Haddington Road Church in Dublin. So. Um, and right through, I, I remember my grandmother in, in, when she was when she was alive, and she was Barlow now. She was one of the, she was, she was Barlow, but um, she would never let anyone speak against Michael Collins, even though um, her son Con was, or sorry, her husband Con was the adjutant general of the Republican forces who opposed Collins. But the friendship she 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 maintained that friendship, I never forgot that when 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 P J was burned out, Collins gave him a house to live in in Dublin, and she she said, 
Now, I don't know when, when he came back from Dublin to live in Tipperary, but she always said that Collins never looked for the house back from them, even though they had, they had taken totally different paths. So, um, so then, to go on then with the, with the, with the, with the family, uh, Jim was the eldest of the boys. May, May um, at that time, was training to be a doctor. And, and was actually lived in the house with her mother in in in, in um, somewhere around the South Circle, around around Haddington Road. So I don't know exactly what the, where the house was, but um, they um, she went to college out of there, and um, in, in and then she was an intern in in in. Um, I think it was Barrington's or John's Hospital in Limerick, and there she met her husband, um, who was a chap by the name of Bob O'Neill, Alphonsus O'Neill. And Alphonsus was one of the, the O'Neill brothers who were really the, very involved in the, in the, in the Clare Brigade and were involved in the, the famous Renin ambush, which was a huge ambush in, in West Clare, which involved in the burning of, of three towns in West, West Clare after as a reprisal, but um, she met Bob there. Um, uh, actually, sadly, she was the one who identified her brother when he was shot by the Black and Tans in Rotrum in 1920. And uh, she was at home at the time in Tipperary. A month later, two months later, they were burned out. But, um, uh, and do you know the circumstances and how, he, how or why he was shot? retaliation for something or was it, was it an ambush or? Uh, it was said uh, and in fact it's still said around Salahed that they were they were betrayed um, you see the, the Gautrum, he was in Gautrum in their old in in, the, in his father's home place they were the farm in Gautrum actually Gautrum is where Gautrum mines was after uh, that was their farm but um, it was in a long passageway, and um, he he was in uniform for some reason, and they wouldn't have always been. They were at the, 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 some activity that they were meeting or something that they had been at, but they came to Gautrum himself and Sean Duffy, who was a Monaghan man, and he was the OC, I think, of the 4th Battalion in Tipperary. He was one of the leaders as well, um, and uh, the house was surrounded. And they, like a lot of old houses at that time, there was only one door, there was no back door. They had to come out the front door and they got up around um, the house, but they, they were both shot. Um, uh, but the, the word was that they were, they were informed on. Uh, and apparently the, the person who did it was, was accounted for <laughs> after. Uh, so, um, so that was, that, that was Paddy. Uh, so going back to May, the eldest of the, the Maloney family, May uh, qualified as a doctor. She was the dispensary doctor in Capamore all her life. And uh, her husband, Bob, um, was, um, as I say, one of the O'Neill family, very famous family in, 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 in Clare, uh, in, in the um, War of Independence. And, he took the, um, the Free State side and was on Collins' staff, uh, he and his brother, uh, in the Civil War. And um, uh, he retired, I'd say, in the, as a combatant in the general demobilization of the National Army in 1928. And Bob lived in Capamore with May and lived out their lives. He was very big into greyhounds and all those things. He was a lovely man. I knew him. and. Uh, Funny enough, there didn't seem to be any rancor in the family. Bob was, you know, he he was. Whereas the boys were were all very much on the Republican side, he was on the other side. But they seemed to get on, and, you know. After now, then Con. Well, I we'll talk about Jim. Then Jim was the eldest of the boys. Jim was very active in the Fourth Battalion in Tipperary, and. Uh, um, went on then when Conn became adjutant general of the Republican forces in the Civil War, um, Jim came with him and became the director of intelligence. 
and after the civil war, uh, well, uh, in I talk about before the civil war ended. Um, as I say, he went with with, with Khan and um, uh, and became involved in the in the on the Republican side during the civil war, and um, they were they were in the Glen of Arlo, spent a lot of their time in the Glen towards the end of the civil war, and in in March 1923, Khan and Jim and a great friend of theirs, Tom Conway, who was reared on the same street as him in Tipperary Town, um, uh, were surrounded in the Glen, and there was a gun battle, and both Con and Tom Conway were severely wounded and captured. Jim got away, and uh, uh, no, he didn't, he was captured as well. The three of them were captured, but, the, but Con and Tom Conway were seriously wounded. And uh, at that, by then, Khan had become deputy chief of, chief of staff, uh, but he was obviously taken out of the whole decision-making process on ending the civil war. Then he was in jail and that, and was remained in jail and was on hunger strike uh, until around the end of 1924. Um, That's quite long. As was Jim. Oh yeah, there were there was 12,000 Republican prisoners in jail after the civil war. And they were in jail for for a year or more. Yeah, they, they just, it became a huge problem for the government at the time, trying to trying to deal with them, obviously. And um, they went on hunger strike. There were major hunger strikes. Jim led a major hunger strike in the Cora, and Khan was involved in. in he was in um, he was in Mount Joy. And he was always say he did thirty nine days hunger strike. And our Lord did 40, he only beat him by a day. So <laughs> that was what he used to say that after. But, um, so um, Jim went on and married uh, Katty Barry, a sister of Kevin Barry's, the Kevin Barry of Mountjoy Jail and the song fame. Um, he was actually the first person to be executed uh, in the, in the um, uh, War of Independence. He, he was hanged in, in, in Mountjoy Jail. Um, Kevin Barry. So Jim married Catty, uh, and they remained to their death uh, anti treatyites but they were they were anti um, establishment. They were, they were very much on the on the um, republican um, view all their lives and, and uh, would have been involved in the setting up of um uh, Tanapogdukta. And that after they never took the, the they never we say PGA were very much sided with Dev and very much very involved in the setting up of Fianna Fáil and that, but but Jim his son stayed more more Republican. Catty was an ardent, absolutely ardent, anti anti establishment woman. She was a great character. I knew her at the end of her days, and they had a dairy in Dublin, and. Uh, um, uh, um, it was it was um, his mother, I think, Kevin Barry's mother, as far as I know, ran the dairy, and they, they supplied the milk from the farm in Carlo. Um, there was a descendant of theirs. Kevin uh, Kevin Barry was a was a Fianna Fáil councillor in 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 Carlo. I'm sure that Barry's are probably still there. But um, and did Jim uh, come back to live in Tipperary? Jim came back to live in Tipperary when they married. Jim married. Immediately they got out of jail in 1924. Jim and Catty married. And the reason they knew each other so well was that Catty was the link person between, the, between Dublin and the South during the Civil War. She spent an awful lot of her time in the South. Uh, and uh, and um, she also went to America fundraising with... Um, with with um, uh, Maud Gaughan. Oh, sorry, no, with um, Countess Markovich. And also, immediately after the Civil War, or they got out of jail, Jim and her, she were married. And immediately after that, Dave sent them to America, or sorry, to Australia, sent Catty, and I don't know who else was with her, um, fundraising to Australia. So. At that time, she she was very strongly pro Dave and all that, 
uh, but when Dev founded Fianna Fáil and went into the Dáil and took the oath, even though he said it was a, an empty formula, um, she broke with Dev at that time and um, stayed very much militant Republican, as did Jim, although he was the mildest, quietest man you ever met. You just, just a lovely gentleman. But they came back to Tucrary. Jim was a pharmacist. He had, it's, I, don't know, I don't know how he got around to it, but with all their activity, but I suppose at that time, you kind of served your time to pharmacy. I don't think there was a university degree. It was, it was probably a, an apothecary, I think, was the, the thing. Uh, uh, so Jim was a chemist, anyway. He came back to Tipperary, and, um, uh, and he and Catty were in the business in Tipperary. But uh, life um, intervened. Um, in the meantime, uh, PJ's wife, Ellen had died, and um, PJ decided to marry again, and he married a, a Kennedy lady uh, from Tipperary Town, and um, uh, it resulted in a break uh, in the sense that uh, whereas Jim and Cathy thought they were immediately going to run the business, PJ said no, he wanted to keep it up himself, and so Jim and Cathy moved back to Dublin. and. Uh, Cathy worked all her life in the Irish sweepstakes. And Jim worked uh, for the, eventually, and they went through hard times, and they went through times when they had very little. Um, but um, they, Jim eventually got work with the Irish Sugar Company in Carlow. And he was there, he worked as a, uh, as a chemist in the Irish, I suppose, in the, in the labs. And, and Cathy, as I say, was the Irish, they lived in, they lived in Winton Avenue in Ratgare, for Winton Avenue in Ratgare, it was, a, it was a, a house I visited many times. Um, and their family, they, they, they had three children. So uh, that was, that was uh, Jim. Khan then married Joan Barlow. Now the Barlows are Shook. Shook was outside the Prairie Town on the road to Galvalley. And um, it was one of the main um, uh, if you like, uh, meeting points or kind of local headquarters of the of the 4th Battalion of the Total Crow Brigade. The 4th Battalion was probably the most active battalion. Uh, certainly one of them, I'm sure people would dispute that, but it was a very active battalion of the of the Total Brigade. And um, the Barlow boys, um, uh, Artie and uh, Matt and Jack, were on their own and were involved. And their mother was Hogan, so that came, <laughs> the thing, <laughs> that connection was there as well. She was one of the Hogans of Anne of Anne, uh, a brother of Tom Hogan, a sister of Tom Hogan, who was vice president of Sinn Féin and who had died in 1918, who was married to Mary Dalton, so you could see all the, the tie-ups. Um, and uh, uh, so, uh, Joan Barlow married Con, and uh, they had four children. Um, one, of the, one of whom was my mother, Josephine, um, who died four years ago. The other was, uh, another was uh, 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 Paddy. Paddy is dead a few years ago. He was the only boy. And then you had, you had Kathleen, who was dead a few years as well. She was Mrs. Condon from Shornell. And, and Maureen, who's still alive. She's Maureen Dunn and lives um, outside the Prairie Town, 93 years of age and totally independent and has perfect recall. She's just a great, a great um, person to meet and chat and a great, if you like, resource when you're... Certainly when I was doing this and writing it up, she did a lot of fact-checking for me. So, um... Uh, three girls and a boy. Uh, three girls, uh, what now, you heard Kathleen? Oh, Eileen was the other, so four girls. God, I couldn't forget Eileen. Eileen was a staunch Republican all her life. Uh, and she was, she was a, a nurse in the district hospital in, in, in Tipperary. Uh, haven't, haven't been, she, she, both she and Kathleen trained as nurses during the Blitz, actually, in the Second World War in London. And uh, Kathleen came back and married Billy Condon in Shornal, and there's Condons there in Shornal all the time. And uh, uh, Eileen didn't marry. She lived with her mother in, in, in Henry Street in Tipperary, 
and um, she's dead a number of years now. So that was the, the Maloney's. Con then, when they came out of jail, you see, as I told you, Jim came back to, to the pharmacy into Prairie, and that didn't work out, and he went back to Dublin with Cathy. Con, um, <coughs> so they couldn't get work. I need the Republican people. The, the, the doors were closed to them, if you like. But Con, just as he got out of jail in 1924, he was appointed secretary of the county council. Now, at that time, the, the, the um, council officials were elected by the councillors. This is different, different now. But um, Con was elected. And um, it had to be ratified, of course, by the by the Minister for Local Government, and it was sent up, and um, <laughs> it was rejected on the grounds that he wasn't considered to be a suitable person to hold that office. So he he um, he really, you know, they 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 uh, found it difficult. But he eventually ended up as um, working for the Irish Public Bodies Insurance Company, which actually insures all the public bodies around Ireland. Con was he was there. I guess the guy who went out and got the business, and he was a, he was their assessor on that, and uh, that was the Irish Public Bodies was set up by the Brennan family from Wicklow. And the Brennans were were very, uh, very um, nationalist family, and 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 uh, they were an anti-treaty family. Uh, you might remember Podge Brennan was a. TD and Wicklow, he would have been connected with him. And actually Neve Brennan, who's married to, to, to uh, Michael McDowell, would be a descendant of the, that Brennan family. Um, so he, he worked with them and died a very young man um, in 1961, I think. Uh, Khan got a heart attack and died in Dublin. Um, then I suppose, you know, when you think of it, they were... Um, uh, they went through a lot of hardship, and and um, he died of a heart attack um, on the eighth of March, nineteen fifty-one. He was only fifty-four. But interestingly, with Con, when when the emergency was declared in nineteen forty-nine, or sorry, nineteen forty what thirty-nine, um, uh, he 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 joined the army. He rejoined the army. And he was a commandant in the Eastern Command throughout the throughout the emergency, and came back out then and worked with Irish public bodies again. And died in 1951. He was only 54. Um, so that was that was Con. So if I accounted for other Nornies, I have uh, May qualified as a doctor. She married Bob O'Neill. She was a uh, dispensary doctor in Capamore. Uh, Jim married Cathy Barry and lived in Winton Avenue in Ratgar. Um, and uh, um, Con married Joan Barlow and had their families. And um, uh, Paddy was shot and got drunk, so that's, that's the Maloney's. So, um, so you yeah, the tie up of the Hogan's, the Dalton's, the Barlow's, and the Maloney's, all very nationalist families going way back. And um, we're all involved in the. In the in the War of Independence. But the interesting thing was that um, while all of my side of the family all took the Republican side, um, uh, that's, you know, the Barlows and the, the Hogans, by and large, were, were, but, you know, there were some others in the family took the, the, the pro-treaty side. And I suppose who are we to second guess who was right and who was wrong? Um, they, they were all people who held very sincere views and, and, and acted them out, you know. So I suppose that's, that's it. She knew ill. Time is a great thing, isn't it? Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. And a, and a bit of love thrown in. Yeah, well, I've always said that. Um, we say, I suppose, my generation, I'm the second generation after the... Um, the people who took part in the War of Independence. I knew all the guys in Tipperary Town as a young fella. I knew all the, the Fitzpatricks and the Barlows. And, well, the Barlows were my uncles and granduncles. And Mickey Fitzpatrick and Sean Fitzpatrick and Morris Crowe. They were all there. They were there when I was a child in Tipperary. I knew them all. And, um, and 
Okay, my mother, I suppose, then was the next generation. My mother was born in 1927. I mean, it was really right in, at the end of the, of the... Her sister, Eileen, actually, was born during the Civil War. They were married in 1920 and uh, in Haddington Road. As a, she was born during the Civil War. And, um, by God, she was a staunch Republican all her life. Um, so, but I always said that my generation, like, surely we shouldn't carry on the, 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 the negativity, you know, we should, we should um, uh, respect um, the fact that the people who took the two sides in the, in the Civil War did so from, from deeply held convictions and were doing their best for Ireland. And that's the way I look at it. So that's, that's it. You were talking about your grandfather? Yeah, Khan. He was, he, I didn't know him. He died. My mother says he died the day I learned to walk. I was born in 1949 and he died in 1951. He was only 54. But he was a very mild man. Uh, never would get into any rancor or discussion. But he, when my mother asked him once about being, being on the run, you know, and all that, and what he said, there was a kind of a romance in it too for young fellows, you know. Uh, and he also said, to, you know, he said, when you think of it, he said, there was more killed in an hour in the Battle of the Somme than the whole War of Independence. That was the perspective he put on it, you know. Uh, but I would have loved to have known him. You know, it's a great pity that he died as such a young man. I knew his brother Jim, again, a very mild, really lovely man, never got involved at all in any of the histrionics after, you know, but was very strongly um, pro-Republican all his life, uh, as was his wife, Cathy. Cathy was a firebrand, very strong. Uh, they very strongly involved in, in um, if you like, the more extreme Republican politics. And Eileen sounded like a bit of a character. Eileen. Eileen was a great character. Um, Eileen, as I say, she, she um, uh, was a nurse. She trained as a nurse during her, she and Kathleen, her sister, um, trained as a nurse during the Blitz. But she, she, was, she nursed in Crumlin Road in Belfast, um, came back to Tipperary then and, and lived there. She was very, very strong Republican. There was no, there was no um, doubt and she, she um, was involved in bringing stuff and looking after the guys that were in, in Mount Joy during the, during the recent troubles and uh, uh, was very much involved in, the, in, in that Republican, the, the, what we call a neo-Republicanism. Um, so well, she went down with her colours flying. She was, she was a, very much a, a strong Republican. Was there much talk, talk of the women and what the women did and during this whole period? Women were very strong. The, the, my father, as I told you, my father's father, my grandfather, died in 1918 in the, um, in the, in the Great Flu. They died within a week of each other. And my father was reared at Barlow's in Shook because Mrs. Barlow was his aunt. She was Hogan. And so my father was only six when, um, when um, his, his parents died. She, he went to Shook as a child and went to Mount Bruce School. And uh, when he was, you know, um, 19, I would say 19, 20, 21, he would have been eight or nine going to school. Uh, the, the tans and the auxiliaries were constantly around Shook because they knew the lads were there a lot of the time. And um, they, um, he used to say that, that the, they'd, they'd open his sandwiches going to school to see if he had messages in them, you know. But they were very, st you talk about the women, they were very strong. Mrs. Barlow Shook um, <clears throat> had to sell her cows because her husband had been dead. Her husband died in 1912 and um, the three boys were on their own. So she had known to, to work the farm and she had to sell her cows and to keep going. And neighbours were great. The neighbours actually took her cows and she got them back when she got going again, you know. Um, but she... Um, had to live through all that. Her daughter Joan, who was my grandmother, she was actually educated in, in England. 
um, and uh, she was a teacher. I don't know if she ever taught, but um, she certainly didn't t teach after Marion Conn. But when she, she was, my father used to say that she was absolutely fearless. She'd face the Uggsies and the, and the RIC coming to the house and she'd throw water out of a basin out in the air and she'd see him coming in and she was absolutely, she said, he often wondered how she wasn't shot. You know, totally fearless and the women, you see, the women had to stay at home. The boys were on their own and were able to get away but the women had to face them and, and, and they, were, they were strong people, no doubt about that, you know. And they were everywhere. When you think right along the safe houses, they were the ones that had to face the the RSC. They hated the RSC because they were Irish people, you know. And of course, a lot of the informers and that came through that. Having said that, there were some great RSC people. And great. And funny enough, a lot of the a lot of the guys who were on the run and a lot of the volunteers, their their parents were RSC, quite a number. And and a lot of RSC were great supporters of of the movement, but in general, they just hated the RSC. Because the RSC were there, you know, when you think of it, they were set up after the Act of Union, and they enforced landlordism and evictions and all that, so you can understand. And of course, there was a huge amount of, of evictions and, and that kind of thing around to Prairie. There was a very, very strong anti-landlord, uh, land league um, uh, ethos around to Prairie, even though it was a garrison town. And one of the biggest garrisons in Munster was into Prairie Town. So you can imagine, we'd say, the local economy into Prairie Town was probably uh, totally supported by the, by the barracks. The thousands, that was it, I forget the name of the regiment that was there. The Sherwood Foresters, I think. Um, they, were, they were, but you can imagine, the, and uh, even during the First World War, when the First World War started, it became a major area for both recruitment and convalescence. So much so that they had to take houses outside the barracks, it was that big, to hold all the, the, the soldiers. So you can imagine the economy at Tipperary, and yet it was probably the most militant, one of the most militant towns in Ireland on the, on the, on the, um, on the volunteer side. The 4th Battalion of the Tug Brigade was one of the most active in Ireland. I suppose you've the the the, the opposite reactions like but they fought landlordism, there was you know, there were um, there was a major um, battle in Ballycohe outside the prairie with 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 a hated landlord, um, Scully. Uh, that only happened in the late eighteen hundreds, you know, so it was it was very much there, you know, and then of course the planning campaign, the whole Building a new to prairie and the, the, the land war with, and the rejection of the Smith Barry estate and all that. So, yeah, nationalism and, you know, support for the British Army. They were they lived side by side. And you can imagine in Tip then the uh, intermarriage, you know, soldiers married local women and uh, all the bitternesses and issues that that, that, that caused. Again, Cupid raised, raised in his head and, sh and shooting his arrow, regardless of where the allegiances were of the family, you know. So, that's it. <laughs> Da <laughs> da